I'm Jennifer Ba, the founder of Young Catholic Professionals, and I want to thank you all so much for being here tonight. Look at this turnout. It's incredible, considering that this group is just over a year old. So I want to thank you all so much for being here and for your support, and I want to thank you for inviting your friends to come to our events. Um, and I just want to tell you that this success is due to your commitment. So I also want to thank you for the impact that you're making on our community. The mission of Young Catholic Professionals is to encourage young adults to work and witness for Christ. We accomplish our mission in three ways. First, we develop a greater sense of our Catholic identity through understanding of Catholic teaching so that we can be ambassadors of Christ in our workplace. Second, we meet in community to encourage one another as Christ's disciples to be steadfast in our journey. Third, we commit to the challenge of rising above mediocrity with sainthood as our final goal for ourselves and for others. To foster a greater sense of community, please introduce yourselves to someone that you don't know sitting next to you. Ever again. 
I don't want to get away from you. I don't want to ever be with you ever again. And then what does the word of God say? I will be with you till the end of time. I will never leave you. Or when someone says, I don't like you, I, 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 I hate you. And what does the Lord say? I lay down my life for you. Don't ever forget that. I lay down my life for you. So here I am reading this article. I'm like, <laughs> no. After 17 years, finally someone explains it to me. So there's so much to learn of our own faith and so much to learn of the things that we take for granted. So I encourage you, yeah, as you're all here present today, to listen to a wonderful guest, uh, guest speaker. You know, also take time to listen to a wonderful guy who created this vast universe but made it feel so cozy. Amen. I'm pleased to introduce to you tonight our executive speaker, Mr. Tom Horton, president of AMR Corporation and American Airlines. Mr. Horton oversees finance, planning, sales and marketing, customer service, information technology, and American's Global Alliance strategy, including its role in the One World Alliance. He reports to Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Gerard Arpey. AMR is the parent company of American. Mr. Horton holds an MBA degree from the Cox School of Business at SMU and graduated magna cum laude from Baylor University. Tom is on the board of trustees for the Catholic Foundation and attends Christ the King Parish. Let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you all for having me tonight. It's a great privilege to be here with you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the intersection of faith and business, which can sometimes lead to interesting results. So I'm going to start off with a little story from the airline business. This is a news story I recently ran across out of Kathmandu, Nepal. Officials at Nepal state-run airline, in response to technical problems on one of its Boeing 757s, have sacrificed two goats to appease the sky god. <laughs> the goats were sacrificed in front of the troublesome aircraft Saturday night at Nepal's Kathmandu airport, according to an airline official, the snag has now been fixed and has resumed flights, apparently without explaining exactly what the problem was. I found this of great interest as we are always looking for ways to improve the reliability of our 757. <laughs> so if you see goats on the ramp at DFW, they're not going to <laughs> I share the story uh, not to poke fun at anybody else's religion. Uh, I'm sure that there are many things about our own faith that non-believers would find very odd indeed. But it does matter what you believe because it informs what you do. I should start off by telling you that I am probably woefully unqualified to speak to you here tonight. You see, I was raised a Methodist and was one for four years and I was a Catholic. And I'm sure most of you could run circles around me on the subject of Catholic theology. And I can make no claim on great moral rectitude. And in business, well, I spent most of my career in the airline business. And in fact, I'm the only person I know who actually escaped the airline business only to jump right back into it. <laughs> And some of my friends have said that uh, that was an IQ test, which I failed. <laughs> <laughs> so my dubious credentials aside, I do have a few thoughts I'd like to share with you after 25 years of business and 20 years of being a Catholic. Let me start with this. In business, as in life, it matters what you believe. In this age of extreme political correctness, some may say that faith and business don't mix. I couldn't disagree more. Your faith, or lack thereof, is really your worldview. 
It informs everything you do and every decision you make. Without it, there's only moral relativism. Or as Pope Benedict said in Youth Day in Madrid recently, we are swimming against the tide in a relativistic culture which wishes neither to seek nor to hold on to the truth. So I should say a little bit about how I've uh, spent my years in business and why I believe what I just said. I spent my working career with two great American companies, American Airlines and AT&T, though most of it in the airline business. I started with American right out of business school, right here at uh, SMU, and I worked my way through a lot of different jobs, mostly on the finance side of the company, and then I had the good fortune to have the opportunity to head American's international business, which is based over in London. And that was really a great experience for, for me. It was a great experience for my family. And for those of you who lived abroad, you know that working in a different country is an education in and of itself. But while we really loved England, and we have a lot of friends there to this day, something I was most struck by in my time there was the apparent absence of faith in daily life. Though there's an official church, as you know, and indeed my own kids went to a Church of England school, there seemed to be a pervasive secular antipathy towards Christianity. And I found that very odd, being a kid who grew up in Texas. We attended a small Catholic church in Kensington, and it was sparsely attended by a few Americans, and some French expats. The Church of England churches were largely empty. And I'll come back to this in just a minute and how it was instructive to my own views on faith. So after having lived in London for a couple of years, I was called back to be the CFO of the company. And I remember getting that phone call from the CEO at the time. It was on the day of Epiphany of the new millennium. And I flew back to Dallas the next day, and that began the two most interesting and unpredictable uh, days of my life. Early that year, the airline business was still fairly strong, but the tech bubble had, had just begun to burst, and business was starting to dip. At just that moment, our largest competitor, United, announced that they were making a bid to buy U.S. Airways. Some of you may remember that long ago. That led to a mad scramble where we decided to buy TWA out of bankruptcy. The United U.S. Air deal was scuttled by the regulators. We completed our deal with TWA to become the largest airline in the world. And that was a real Pyrrhic victory, which we were about to learn. In the fall of 2001, we were busy with the enormous task of integrating TWA into our airline, and our entire company was stretched just as tight as it could be, or so we thought. Then came September 11th, and I awoke that morning, as I usually do, and I went for a long run in anticipation of a very busy day. And I was in my office around 7.30 in the morning. Uh, we were about to price a $2 billion aircraft bond financing, the biggest financing of its kind. And that was going to be the cornerstone of our financing plan for the, uh, the upcoming year, very much part of the, the post-merger planning. And I first learned that something was wrong when my assistant came in and said we had a cell phone call uh, that a flight attendant had attacked on one of our airplanes. And a minute later, our chief operating officer at the time, Gerard Arp, who was now our CEO, went dashing out the door over to our operations center. And minutes later, there were reports that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. What I didn't know then was that it was our airplane. So I walked down to a dark, uh, empty conference room. I flipped on CNN, and I watched the second attack on 
unfold, and I'm sure many of you did. Shortly after uh, I joined our senior team in the operations center, we were trying to make sense of, of what was happening. Information was sketchy, but what we did know was that it was a coordinated attack. Two planes hit the World Trade Center, one of ours hit the Pentagon, and at least one more was unaccounted for. So we made the call to do something that had never been done before. We ordered our entire fleet immediately onto the ground, landed at the nearest airport. Shortly thereafter, the FAA ordered the, the same for um, the entire industry. So I was on the phone with the bankers, and of course the markets were in turmoil, our financing deal was off, our liquidity was thin, and our entire fleet had just been grounded. It was very bad. So we immediately drew down our billion dollar credit <laughs> facility from Citibank to avoid immediate financial calamity. But we didn't know the extent of the tragedy at the time. By the end of the morning, 23 of our colleagues uh, and 3,000 other innocent Americans were lost. It was impossible to comprehend that uh, at the time. And it still is, at least to me, now 10 years later. So four days after 9-11, we set about the unprecedented task of reviving an airline that also happened to be knee-deep in a merger. The months ahead were all about survival. Travel demand had collapsed, and we did everything we could to preserve cash and preserve the company. We cut the schedule deeply, we grounded airplanes and furloughed employees. We negotiated deferrals of billions of dollars of aircraft deliveries, and we eventually revived part of that bond financing. And we borrowed against most of our assets. So we made a lot of progress. Things settled down. And later the following year, it appeared that the company and the industry was on the mend. It was then that I made the, uh, the tough decision to, uh, to leave and to join AT&T. And that was the end of my 17th career with American and a couple of pretty eventful years as chief financial officer. I joined up with my good friend Dave Dorman, who was the CEO of AT&T and spent four pretty wild years in the telecom industry. And telecom during the first half of the decade was characterized by savage competition, overcapacity, price wars, <coughs> hyper-regulation, and bankruptcy. So after years in the airline business, I felt right at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'll spare you the stories from the telecom years, only to say that it culminated in the sale of the company to SBC to form the new AT&T, which ironically is headquartered you know, just down the road from here. I'll never forget making the pitch to sell the company in our Manhattan boardroom under the gaze of a life-size portrait of Alexander Graham Bell, who founded the company. After that deal, and after taking a couple months off, I got a call from American CEO, my good friend Gerard Arden, and he graciously asked me to return to the company. It was a very kind offer, and I suppose a more sensible person would have run for the hills. <laughs> but I have great respect for Gerard, and I've always had a great love for the company, and Lord knows there's a lot of unfinished business at American Airlines. After 9-11, the company went on to endure what we now call the decade of survival. It was a decade that saw record oil price spikes, wars, pandemics, the Great Recession, and all of that took its toll on the industry. All of our big competitors were forced into bankruptcy. America narrowly avoided that fate, but as a result, today we have higher costs in our competitors. We have higher debt, we have higher pension and uh, uh, liabilities in our competitors. And it's a huge challenge. So in this age of bankruptcies and bailouts, we've clearly taken a harder path. And Gerard likes to say it is a more honorable path. 
And I think it is, but time will tell whether that is sustainable if we work to quickly reposition the company and make it successful. Some of you may have read we recently executed the largest aircraft purchase in history to completely renew our fleet and create the youngest fleet in the industry. That will lower our fuel and maintenance costs and provide a state-of-the-art in-flight product. But we still need to address our cost disadvantages, and we'll need to do it very soon, one way or the other. So I think it is fair to say that the final chapter has yet to be written, and I am pretty sure that it will not be dull. Okay, so by now I think you can conclude that I have either chosen really hard businesses or that I'm the source of the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but what does this have to do with what we're here talking about tonight? I sometimes ask myself, as I'm sure many of you do, am I making any difference? Does this have any meaning in the context of my own faith? And my wife occasionally reminds me of a story that some of you may have heard about a corporate executive who was facing spiritual crisis and went to Calcutta to seek advice from Mother Teresa. She counseled him sternly and told him to go back home to Wisconsin and be a good CEO so that his company might prosper and keep many people gainfully employed. Bloom where you're planning, she told him. I try to remember that each of us has a vocation to go out and do as much good as we can in the context of our faith. It doesn't take overt evangelism. It means doing as much good as you can, guided by your faith and values of the scriptures. I believe we all have a duty to practice our faith in our daily life and vocation, lest it atrophy and die. It was said well by St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. That's a pretty daunting call. Which brings me back to London which has been, as I think all of you know, much in the news lately. There has been a lot of hand-wringing among the media about what has given rise to the alarming outbreaks of lawlessness in a wealthy and advanced nation. The explanations run from the economy to unemployment to a welfare state gone wrong to general moral disintegration of society. And I thought back to my time there and the many visits since, and a feeling that something was amiss in a society which had so abruptly abandoned its Judeo-Christian belief system. In favor of what, I think, is still very much unclear. Then I read something which really struck me. And you may have seen this piece in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I have left um, copies at the back. It's called Reversing the Decay of London Undone. And it's written by Lord Sachs, who is the chief rabbi of the Commonwealth. In it, he contends very convincingly, I think, that the abandonment of faith in everyday life in Britain has led to a great moral disintegration since the 1960s. And he cites some pretty alarming facts, such as over 40% of British children are born out of wedlock. He goes on to say that Britain has been spending its moral capital with the same reckless abandon that it spent its financial capital. Those are pretty strong words. And I don't mean to pick on Britain, a country that I have great affinity for. The same is true, of course, for much of Europe. It has become a post-Judeo-Christian culture. And I think it's not too hard to argue that that's for the worse. Without active practice of our faith every day in forums like this, 
And in our daily vocations, who's to say that our faith is not the same? I try to read and learn from people who think much more deeply about such matters than me. And people <laughs> say there are a lot of people who think more deeply than me. There's an American theologian and a writer uh, that I like named Tim Keller. Some of you may know of him. In his book, The Reason for God, he makes a strong and persuasive argument that Christians in Western nations have been the great forces of self-correction. Guided not by some vague notion of justice, but rather brought by practical applications of biblical values. And he goes on to cite William Wilberforce, who led the abolition of the slave trade in Britain. And that's a truly historic story, which I'm sure many of you know. He points to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran who fought Nazism and was martyred for it. Of course, in our own country, there was the fight for civil rights and the fight against racism led by Martin Luther King. More recently, the triumph over communism brought about by President Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and Pope John Paul. What all these people had in common was an abiding belief in the dignity and freedom of all men, which is informed by their faith and their understanding of God's will. I wonder how the world would be different if those people instead espoused the views of your garden variety atheists, such as Richard Dawkins. I think it would be a very different place. Much of the post-Christian world today seems to suggest that science and God are incompatible, which is sophisticated for God. Science has somehow disproven God. And I'm reminded of a story about a Russian cosmonaut who returned from space and reported that he had not found God. <laughs> C.S. Lewis responded to this and said that this was like Hamlet going into the attic of his castle and looking for Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> so Lord Sachs ends his piece on London with a passage from the Harvard historian Niall Ferguson, who's a great writer, in his recent <laughs> book, Civilization. The book asks whether the West can maintain its primacy on the world stage, or is it in decline? He quotes a member of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, <laughs> tasked with finding out what gave the West its great dominance. And this guy said, at first we thought it was your guns, then we thought it was your political system, democracy. Then we said it was your economic system, capitalism. But for the last 20 years, we have known it was your religion. It was the Judeo-Christian heritage that gave the West its relentless pursuit of a tomorrow that would be better than today. The Chinese have learned the lesson. 50 years after Chairman Mao declared China a religion-free zone, there are now more Chinese Christians than there are members of the Communist Party. Great. So Sachs ends with this. China has learned the lesson. The question is, will we? So I've talked a little bit about business and a career that has seen its share of ups and downs. Probably will see a few more. And I've talked about my own views on faith and how it relates to the world. So how does that all come together? I think everything you or I do is informed by our faith, our worldview. And I think history has shown that that matters a lot. It matters whether you're a president, a CEO, Count, a farmer, a pilot, or a school teacher. I've been thinking a lot lately about 9 11, and as the 10 year anniversary is just a few days away, it's hard for me and I'm sure all of you to believe that 10 years has passed since that horrible day. It's still hard to make sense of an act so evil 
brought about falsely in the name of religion. So what did that mean, and what did it teach us? That will be discussed and debated long after we're gone. But I've offered this modest thought to you tonight. The leader of Al-Qaeda has been brought to justice, and some may say that's a victory. I would say that Islamist extremism is an idea, not a person or an organization. It's an idea much like slavery was an idea, racism, Nazism, communism, are all flawed ideas of men. And there will be a lot more, some I'm sure we haven't even conceived yet. And they can't be beaten with guns or tanks or bombs. They can only be beaten by a superior idea. If not by that, then by what? Think about that. As Christians and as Catholics living in the greatest nation on earth, we have a great responsibility. And it starts with what we do every day. Thanks for your time. I'd be happy to take some questions. Anybody have a question? You just want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, far away. Uh, you said you converted to Catholicism. I was I wondering what your path was, what maybe your religion was before, and how you converted. I married a woman. I was raised Catholic, and uh, uh, my family is, is mother and father, brothers, all up to this day. So I'm sort of the only Catholic in the family. But I married a Catholic girl 28 years ago, and um, and I, uh, you know, I went to I went to mass with her uh, quite a bit off and on over the years, and. Um, I guess I'm sort of a slow learner, but after uh, many, many years, I, I came around and I've, I've uh, been a Catholic for about 20 years now. And I go to Christ the King, and uh, I, uh, it's been a great blessing. A great blessing for me and, and my family. I have two, two kids. One I just dropped off at college this weekend, and uh, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> that was really tough. So I'm still getting over that. <laughs> yes? That day that you were speaking of your prayers in that office, so were people praying in the office that day? Yes, yes, people were praying in that office. And I'll tell you, um, there are a lot of, uh, there, I'm you know, blessed to work with a lot of uh, great Christians in, uh, in our company at the highest level, including Gerard Rocky, who is one of the most uh, faith filled people I know and uh, is an inspiration to me. He's been through more than anybody ever ought to have to go through in their lifetime as a business leader. He's done it with tremendous grace and with much criticism from people in his own company, which is sad, but you know, that's the way it is. But he, is, um, he has never allowed himself to be a victim. He has always led with grace. Most difficult circumstances. And that's been a that's been a real inspiration for me. And I see some of my colleagues from back in here tonight. And I'm sure they would I'm sure they would say the same thing. Yes. Uh, was there ever a time as you were sort of moving up the ladder uh, and you felt like something some decision you had to make conflicted with your faith? Well, that's a it's a good question, and I will tell you the answer is, and I'll probably, you know, I'll probably get this wrong. I'm sure there were times in my career, but they don't jump to mind, so they can't have been seminal. I, I will tell you that I've tried to live by a few kind of simple, really simple principles, because that's the way my mind works. I'm a pretty simple person. <laughs> and I've always tried to start with what's what's right, you know, what's what's honest and true. And I think if you start with that, you avoid a whole lot of pitfalls and a whole lot of potential problems. So I've always tried to say what is right and what is, what is true. And then dealing with colleagues, and my colleague may dispute this tonight, I try to treat people <laughs> as I would like to be treated. I mean, it's just pretty simple stuff. 
And uh, that doesn't always mean, it doesn't mean not being driven, because I am driven. And I think it is actually our calling to go do our job to the best of our ability and accept nothing less than the best we can do. But I think you should always treat your, your colleagues with the um, way you want to be treated. And then the last that I, I, I have tried to live by is trying to keep perspective. You know, these jobs are hard. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, has a life that has many challenges. Your job is hard and frustrating at times, but keep perspective and, and remember that you know, your family, your faith, and your avocations are more important than your vocation. Uh, and so I, I, I try to do that. And I think by you know, following a few simple principles, um, you can steer clear of, you know, a lot of madness. And I will say, you know, I have been blessed by working for a company twice, two companies, that I would say have, um, had a culture of honesty and integrity and a lot of good people around them. And that makes it a lot easier. You know, I, I spent four years in the telecom industry and I won't bore you with the stories of that, but the first thing that happened when I got to AT&T, I picked up the newspaper one morning and I read that WorldCom was embroiled in an $8 billion accounting fraud. And, you know, that brought a lot of havoc in the telecom industry and brought a lot of havoc in AT&T, but AT&T, to its credit, threw out a lot of craziness in the telecom industry and a lot of fraud. Played it right down the middle. And so I, I do think it matters a lot you know, who you associate yourself with. And uh, that, can, that can really help you a long way. Yes? You spoke earlier about the world we live in being much about political correctness. You're in a high profile position and you came to speak to us tonight about your faith. Mm -hmm. What allowed you to make that decision to come and talk about your faith um, in this highly political environment? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And we live in a great country. So, you know, I feel that uh, I have freedom to talk about anything I want to talk about <laughs> in any place I want to talk about it. And so when Jen asked me to come and talk tonight, I, you know, I, I welcome the opportunity. Um, you know, I think the workplace, obviously, you have to be sensitive to the many points of view, the many world views that are represented around the table, and I always try to do that, but I would never shrink from um, describing my faith and uh, how it might apply to a situation uh, in the workplace, and uh, but I think the most important thing to do is not necessarily proselytize or uh, but rather to live in a way that people can see that you are living by a code, you are living by your faith. And, you know, I'm a long way from doing a good job at that, but I try. And I think people, uh, I think that's what people most respond to. Yeah. Uh, in your position, obviously, you're uh, involved in making financial decisions with respect to the welfare of a lot of people yep. in large company. How do you manage your stress and how do you deal with the, uh, you know, the, the, the weight of the authority that, that you have? <laughs> yeah, I run a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> I really do run a whole lot because I find that that is the best way to keep the madness down during the day. So I, I do that. I try to, um, you know, I try to spend a lot of time with my family. And, Fish. I have lots of different interests and I try to you know, keep, keep a little balance there. But I will say something, you, you raise a really good question. And it, um, you know, in jobs like this, uh, many jobs that you folks have, you do have to make hard decisions. And they do affect people's lives. And it isn't always obvious that the decision you have to make is for the greater good. And I think, um, I think this is kind of endemic in our country right now, that elected politicians and leaders tell people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And, you know, Boots, our company is a company right now where people need to hear what they need to hear. 
not what they want to hear. Because that's what's best for them in the long run. And it may, some, sometimes it may sound hard, but um, you're not doing people any favors by not telling them the truth. And um, I, you know, I don't want to get off into a political track here, but I do think it is important that we as Christians and we as Americans are people who confront reality as generations before us have and overcome the first thing. But the first thing you got to do is confront reality. I hope that won't be political. <laughs> yes? Speaking of what people need to hear, are uh, airline prices ever going to be back down? <laughs> right after we did the big airplane deal and I was talking to uh, Richard Quest. Have you guys ever seen him on CNN International? He's just such a character. <laughs> anyway, he asked me this question. He said, so, you got all these brand new airplanes and, and it's going to bring your fuel costs down and you've done this deal with British Airways and when are we going to have lower fares? <laughs> he said, not if I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a lot of low fares today, so you can get on AA.com. There's <laughs> lots of very, very low fares. You can get on almost anywhere in the world that's DFW. It's a great blessing. Yeah. 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 Okay, what else before I let you go home? Yes. Here tonight as an analyst. 